Hello everyone and welcome back to Lady Disdain Reads. Today we talk about the sixth and final major novel by Jane Austen, Persuasion. When preparing for this video, I found this to be the hardest novel to discuss, simply because there are too many topics that I would like to cover within this book. One can discuss ways in which Persuasion is the most capital R romantic of Jane Austen's novels, all the symbolism of the sea, the role of the navy and social mobility in persuasion, or even the topic of age and ageing, the list simply goes on. Nevertheless, I want to maintain my focus on virtue ethics and literature, which has been the core of my channel so far. And check out some of my other videos um, if you want more information about what virtue ethics means. For that purpose, today I will make a case for persuasion as a pilgrimage narrative, leading the protagonist Anne Elliot to a newfound sense of her place within both her family and her society more widely. The virtues I will be discussing um, today, which allow Anne Elliot to um, grow as, as an individual, are constancy, hope and faith in divine providence. Without further ado, let's get straight into discussing this novel. Let's start with the idea that Persuasion is a story about a pilgrimage. Compared to a novel like Emma, Persuasion is a novel of motion, of movement, both spiritual and physical. It begins with the destabilising news that it will be necessary for the Elliots to lease out their home and relocate to somewhere cheaper, in this case Bath, due to their extravagant expenses. Thus, Anne is forced to leave her childhood home, her ancestral home, the home that she associates with her long dead mother, um, Kellynch Hall. From there, Anne will first visit her sister Mary, who is now Mrs Musgrove, at Uppercross Hall, before accompanying the Musgrove family, along with Captain Wentworth, to the coastal town of Lyme Regis. Finally, Anne will join her father and older sister Elizabeth in Bath. The backbone of the narrative, um, or rather of the nar narrative arc in this novel, thus rests on a portrayal of movement, change and uncertainty. Anne, what may I say, does not really live anywhere in the novel. She has no longer a fixed home. She has no physical point of reference, no anchor, if you will pardon the naval pun. She is on a pilgrimage to regain a sense of stability. She is herself a pilgrim looking for a centre of gravity, if you will. And so we come to the first of the virtues that I wish to discuss, that of constancy. For philosopher Alistair MacIntyre, constancy is the one virtue in Austen that is a prerequisite for all other virtues to exist, and it is undeniably one that is central to persuasion. The virtue of constancy is contrasted, as aforementioned, with the inconstancy or uncertainty of external circumstances. Anne and Wentworth are both, in a sense, wanderers, moving from place to place within the course of the novel, but they do not waver in their affections. Captain Wentworth initially believes Anne to have been inconstant to him for breaking off their engagement eight years prior. And in many ways, he also believes himself to um, have changed in the way that he feels about her. The narrative itself, I think, really focuses not so much on Anne's realisation that she still has feelings for Wentworth. That is clear from the start, but rather on Wentworth's own slow realisation that both himself and Anne have remained constant in their love for each other. In what is probably the most famous scene in the book, Captain Wentworth listens in to a conversation between Anne and Captain Harville on the virtue of constancy. Anne disagrees with Harville that men are more likely to be constant than women arguing that while she does believe men to be capable of constancy, it's worth noting that she uses that exact word, she believes women are capable of, quote, loving longest when existence or when hope is gone. It's crucial to remember that this conversation takes place towards the end of the story. By this point, Captain Benwick has already surprised everyone by becoming engaged to Louisa Musgrove, despite having recently lost his fiancée, Captain Harville's own sister. When Anne mentions loving when existence is gone, 
one can't help but perceive her words to be a mildly veiled criticism towards Benick for forming a new attachment so soon after the death of his fiance. Furthermore, this quotation also introduces the second of the virtues that I wish to discuss, and that is the virtue of hope. It's not a coincidence that in what is possibly the most quoted sentence in all of persuasion, Captain Wentworth declares to Anne, I am half agony, half hope. These words, which are to be found at the beginning of the letter he addresses to Anne as a direct result of the conversation that he overhears between her and Captain Harville, um, also result in their uh, renewed engagement. She claimed in that conversation with Captain Harville that women love longest when hope is gone. Again, she uses that word specifically, hope. Here, Wentworth echoes those exact words um, in a scene that takes place not long after um, the conversation between Anne and um, Campton Harville within the novel. In spite of being half agony, Wentworth is still half hope. And this tentative hope is the reason both Anne and Wentworth are able to transcend the inconstancy of those around them um, and the instabilities of the, of the circumstances in their lives. If you've seen any of my previous videos, you will know that I enjoy discussing the importance of Austen's Anglican brand of Christianity um, within her novels. So why is her Christian faith important in her novels and how do we see that? While constancy is a virtue, the first one we talked about, is more Aristotelian, in the sense that it is not to be um, attained through God's grace, but rather through practice, through um, habit, it's to be reinforced by habit. Hope, instead, is a distinctly theological virtue, as it cannot be attained through exertion, but can only be granted to us by God through grace. Now, if you um, don't know what I mean when I say that constancy is a more Aristotelian kind of virtue, then um, I suggest that you check out my um, Jane Austen and Ethics playlist as I go into a lot of detail about um, Aristotle and Austen in several of my videos. So we were talking about hope, um, and I can tell you that hope is one of the three chief theological virtues. So we have hope, charity and faith. In his seminal work, Summa Theologiae, Medieval um, theologian Thomas Aquinas cites St Paul's letter to the Hebrews, which defines hope as, quote, the anchorage of souls and as something sure and immovable. How fortunate for us analysing persuasion today that St Paul should refer to hope as an anchor um, as we are dealing with a novel concerned with the Navy. It's the perfect metaphor for us to be um, thinking about hope in persuasion. Hope is indeed Captain Wentworth's spiritual anchor in a sea of uncertainty, both literally, as he's a captain in the Navy, and also metaphorically, because the circumstances in his life, um, when it comes to his personal life, are very uncertain. But are our hopes in persuasion <laughs> uh, ever to be fulfilled? Um, how can we hope when all hope is gone, as um, Anne Elliot says? Here, I think it's helpful to move on to the last virtue which I wish to discuss today, and that's the theological virtue of faith. While hope looks to the future and is a desire for good to be attained, faith for Christians is utter and complete trust in God's goodness and in his love for us. Thus, we need faith in order to have hope. Aquinas himself defines hope as, quote, a future good, difficult but possible to attain. And that is in the same section of his work on theology in which he um, had quoted the letter to the Hebrews as saying that um, hope is an anchor. So if it's a good that is possible to attain but difficult, how is it to be attained? Well, Aquinas tells us this as well. He distinguishes between goods that can be attained through um, our exertion and goods that can be attained only through um, God's help. And of hope, he says it is possible, quote, through means of divine assistance. So he's pointing us to the necessity for us to have faith in God's help 
to trust in what we can call divine providence, or the belief that God governs the events of the world, and thus both protects us and leads us on the right path. Now, why is this relevant to persuasion? Well, persuasion is actually the only one of Austen's novels to use the word providence a total of three times. I believe Mansfield Park uses it once, um, but persuasion is the only one to use it more than once. Out of these three examples, I think two are particularly important, as they show how both Anne Elliot and Captain Wentworth trust in the workings of divine providence. That is what allows them to have um, hope in the first place. The fact that they have faith in God's providence um, consequently allows them to continue to hope. So the first example is this. When Wentworth comes back into her life after long years of separation, Austen's omniscient narrator tells us this of Anne. How eloquent were Anne's wishes on the side of warm attachment and a cheerful confidence in futurity against that over-anxious caution which seemed to insult exertion and distrust providence. So what is Anne saying exactly here? She is partly regretting her decision to break off her engagement, and this is because she now thinks being excessively prudent is to insult um, both exertion, meaning human capacity for hard work and self-improvement, but also providence, meaning, as Aquinas puts it, divine assistance. At 19, Anne's faith in providence was not strong enough, it would seem, to counter her family's objections and pressure to um, break off her engagement with Wentworth. But now, at the age of 27, she is confident enough in her faith that she can declare to Harville that women can love even when hope is lost. So strong, indeed, um, is women's faith, and with the implication of Anne's own, um, in God's assistance. The second crucial moment if, of providence occurs um, after the trip to Lyme Regis, when Wentworth, commenting on the fact that Anne stumbled upon her cousin William Elliot twice during her stay in Lyme Regis, says this, We must consider it to be the arrangement of providence that you should not have been introduced to your cousin. We can assume that by this point, Wentworth has realised that he is still attached to Anne. And thus he sees it as providential that Anne and Mr Elliot, a potential rival to um, Anne's affections, have not properly met, despite stumbling upon each other in Lyme Regis. Wentworth seems to think that providence is on his side, insofar as it is facilitating his reunion with Anne, at the same time hindering her potential attachment to um, another suitor, to William Elliot. By the end of the novel, I think um, we can also feel as readers that um, Providence has helped Anne and Mr Wentworth to reunite. Um, and I think we can agree with both of them that Providence played a major role in, um, in finding the sense of stability that I was talking about again. Um, so in a sense, uh, what I want to take away from this is that while you have these three major virtues um, that I think are crucial to persuasion, so constancy, hope and faith, there is a sort of order um, in which we must place them for um, all of them to be possible. So I think faith and divine providence is paramount. That is the prerequisite virtue that both Anne and Wentworth must have in the novel. Faith causes them to have hope <laughs> and having hope causes them through exertion to become or to remain constant to each other. For all these reasons, I rest my case that Persuasion is a novel about constancy and uncertainty, but even more importantly, it's about a novel, um, it's a novel about hope in the absence of hope and about faith in God's providence. I hope you enjoyed this video and my next one will be a review of an article by theologian Peter Lightheart titled Real Men Read Austen, which I think is a brilliant title. So if you're curious about what that title could mean, don't forget to subscribe and keep checking this channel for a new video to come out soon. Thank you for watching and goodbye.